There may be no four stars in this class so far for Boston College football, but there's plenty of reasons to get excited about the class of 2025. You are locked on Boston College, your daily podcast on the Boston College Eagles. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Locked On Boston College, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. This is AJ Black. I am your host. I'm also the editor and publisher of Eagle Insider, part of the Two Four Seven Network. Today's episode is a big one. We got to recap the class of twenty twenty five as many of the pieces are in, and we're going to look at what BC has in place, how our views of the group group of 19 right now are looking where there's weaknesses, where there's strengths and everything in between. And then to wrap things up, a new college football rule is changing the way how coaches and analysts work. I'm going to explain how this impacts BC, the positives and negatives. You'll hear it all here on today's episode. So let's kick it off. We just finished the big recruiting block of the season called official visit season. I usually use like hashtag official visit season. And we are Boston College is now at 19 official commitments for the class of 2025. There's a few silence as well that we don't know about yet. And there's a few crystal balls. If you're on 247, you know all about that. With a class this big, and it's only going to get bigger, probably over 25. How is this group looking? And is it worth getting excited about? Because I get people texting me. I got someone tweeting at me this morning like, AJ, I don't see any four stars. I don't see, you know, these big names that you're looking for, blah, 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 blah. And I want to say, I get your point. There, that That is partially a concern with this class is there's no super high-end talent here. Like, there's no four stars. And I know a lot of people get stuck on the stars. But you look at the class. You look at where they're at. They're in the top 40 in the, in the nation right now. They have one of the most, probably the second or third biggest classes. Syracuse is up. There's a few other schools that have had some big classes as well. But one thing I look at when I make my big board, when I talk to the staff, when I look at, you know, when I, when I discuss with the the people who are in charge of recruiting, I look at how the staff did identifying their talent and executing their recruiting plan to get them here. You look, let's look at last year, for instance, for BC. It was a small class. Their, you know, star ratings or whatever is lower than this year, but I'm not even going to look at that. If you go back to 2024, 2023, the class of 2024, and look at what BC's big board looked like, and you looked at who committed to them, it's drastically different. Because Jeff Halfley had to go to option B and option C and option D for a lot of his positions because he he struggled. The, the team just came off a three and nine season and it impacted his recruiting. So that was a tough year. Now, I ask you to look at my big board, go over to Eagle Insider. I can put it up if you need it in the show notes. Look at each position that BC has targeted and look who is committed to the Eagles so far. And at every position, they have landed the top guys that they've been going after. Now, there's been a few that have been on their big boards that maybe be higher up that you wish they landed. Guys like Hardy Watts, Jayon Young. You know, higher-end guys, they just, I mean, Jayon Young and Hardy Watts, I mean, there's not much you can do at at, at being a school like Boston College. Jayon Young stayed closer to home. Hardy Watts wants a blue, blue blood. It is what it is. But you look at some of the other names. First of all, quarterback. BC last year struck out, gosh, five or six times, I feel like, trying to get a quarterback for the class 24. And I'm not knocking Jonathan Montague because I still like his film. I think he's going to be an exciting player, whether it's a quarterback or another position. He's got athleticism. He'll get on the field. I look at, you know, that they didn't get any of that. Now, BC this year, Shake or Razig, it wasn't on our big board because they wouldn't tell me it, but I have been told from good sources that he was their number one commit uh, their number one target all along. You look at running back, Makai Dodd, local kid. Obviously, you want that. Nolan James. Okay, so you had both of those guys already in place. They're in the running for two other guys that they've been looking at that are very high on their boards. Wide receivers, 
it's like Daryl Wyatt is just picking and choosing who he wants at this point. Like he's getting, you know, Samaj Fleming, Nedrick Bolden, uh, and a few other guys that that are are still floating around. So like at wide receiver, he's doing well. Tight end, again, they got their number one, Bryce Lewis. And they, as I said on yesterday's show, there's number two and three. They're going to probably get, you know, one or two of those guys. And they don't have to go further down their board. Now, one piece I would say is when you're looking at this class, one thing I like to look at is, is yeah, you want to look at the stars. You want four stars. And, and I get that. And I'm not saying that that's, that you you would like to see that in this class. There's a few guys that are going to be close. Like if they land Marcus Upton, he's a he's a hair away from a four star. Uh, a big senior season, they'll push him up. But what I look at is a f- other schools that are interested in your player. Like if you're get, getting a ton of kids that are rated in 85, which is like middle of the road three stars, right? There's two different kinds I look at. There's the kids that are rated in 85. And they pick BC and that's it. And you know what? You have to hope to hope that their evaluations work. I look at kids that are rated in 85 and that are evaluated by multiple schools. And I say to myself, oh, okay. There's multiple schools that see something in this kid. He must have something. And for the most part, when you look up and down this commitment list, when you take each kid most of them, TJ Green, I think maybe one of, maybe like one that's not a local kid, a, a local recruit that did not have any other big offers. But you look at, Ch- at Shaker Razig, uh, Nolan James, your tight end, Bryce Lewis, your offensive lineman, Robert Smith, um, your linebacker, um, Zakari John- Thomas. Most of the guys that are not from the New England area had offers from other programs. That is a good sign because in years past, there's a lot of kids that came here that did not. And it's not just they get an offer and then they go somewhere else, like that they um, go to BC. Many of them took official visits elsewhere, which is a good sign too, that these other schools not only just offered them, but also went that next step with them. Now the kids that don't, a lot of them on your roster are the local recruits. I have him up on on the screen. Griffin Collins, he had an offer from Syracuse, so he doesn't count. But Mike Amity, who is probably my favorite recruit in this class so far, because this kid loves Boston College. If you don't follow Michael Mike Amity on Twitter or Instagram, you need to. This kid is the biggest cheerleader for Boston College sports I've seen in, in a couple of years. Like he is in there, like talking to the kids that are are visiting and you know pumping up BC. He's a fun kid. He's from Zavarian. He doesn't have any other office, but honestly, I don't care. He's a local kid. They evaluated him. I've heard good things about him. Uh, Najida, N- Najida Sankala, another one. They started a camp. He's from Connecticut. You know, he oh, he's playing in Connecticut. He's from Canada. I think he's from Winnipeg. But he's a local kid again. Another um, one without major offers, but they're local. That's what you want. Like, you want to get a, a handful of local kids. Now, in a moment... I'm going to talk a little bit about some factors that impacted this class and some areas of concerns I still have moving into the month of July. We'll get into all of that in just a moment. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices view from your seats and their lowest prices guaranteed, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets. The biggest surprise this year has been the Boston Red Sox. Like I, beginning of this season, I didn't think they were going to do anything. Now they're what seven games above 500. They're talking about being buyers at uh, the the trading deadline. They've got all these prospects coming up that are looking really good, and all of a sudden, seats at Fenway are becoming a hot item again. And you can get through all of that nonsense with game time. You want to get a good seat? Get on game time. They'll, sh- they'll give you a seat viewer. You'll know exactly what you're looking at, what you're getting into when you go there. And they have great prices. I love the prices at game time because you know you're going to get a good deal. So make sure you go over to game time and sign up today. Use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E for $20 off. 
Download Game Time today. Lowest prices guaranteed. This is Locked On Boston College. AJ Black here. Now, we're talking about the class of 2025. They're ranked in the top 40 right now on 247. They, you know, their average star rating is a little bit lower than I, I would expect, but that's also because there's at least two or three kids that do not have a composite rating yet. So that those will come and we'll, get, we'll see how that kind of impacts their composite score. But there's still concerns, right? There's still things that you, you're looking at and going, hmm. So what, why are, why are these concerns coming up? Part one, when you're looking at a recruiting class, you need to understand that a lot of times recruits have been in contact with these staffs for over a year. Many of them start their recruiting in their freshman or sophomore year. Obviously, Bill O'Brien, he just took over in March. Like this is a late start for him to pull together a class, especially when he basically retooled a whole side of the ball with a new defensive with a new defensive staff. Now you're going to get a guy like Daryl Wyatt who's going to do his thing and he's going to be fine. Clearly the wide receiver group is fine. You get a guy like Savon Huggins, the running back room is fine. A little bit more worried about the offensive line and what Matt Applebaum's done there, but we'll have to wait and see. There's still a couple uh, pokers in the fire, and I feel like there could be some good news hopefully soon there. But the defensive side of the ball, there's all new names. It's all like you look at the edge, the edge issue here, which I've talked about on yesterday's show. You would hope that there'd be more than one, but you have a brand new coach, Jeff Comision, who he's been here before, but it was 10 years ago. He's he's got a you know, go out there and battle against, you know, um, some positional coaches that have been there for a while. And again, they don't do it the way a team like Syracuse do, do does with their flashy, you know, selling pitches and cars and all that nonsense. So it makes it a little tougher. And I'm not making an excuse, but I'm just telling you, I expect that next year is where you're going to see more fireworks, like the bigger names. I mean, we already got a quarterback for next year and an offensive lineman who could be a very high three-star, uh, depending on where he goes. But I look at this year and, and, and go, they had to basically start from scratch at a lot of positions to, to, to recruit. And that's tough. It's a little bit like playing behind the eight ball in terms of their recruiting. Now, uh, you, you take the picture at 19 right now. <laughs> it feels like half of them are defensive backs because I think half of them are defensive backs. There's some positions that are still a, a concern. Linebacker is fine. They have two there. Defensive back clearly is fine. Tight end, it'll be fine. Wide receiver is fine. Running back's fine. Quarterback's fine. It's the two trenches. And that myself, my my biggest concern is right there. And And, and I should say, it's not completely the trenches because I think defensive tackle should be okay soon. As I said, Josiah Victor or Kadir Dembale will probably make it two plus two, maybe even three for defensive tackles. I think that position will be okay. As I said before, edge you got one. Yeah, they need depth there, bad. And I don't think they're, that that ha- that has happened yet. And of course, what everyone's talking about, and I and I get it, is the offensive line. Like I talked about the last segment. They have one commitment there now um, with Robert Smith. Now they have Denzel Williams announcing on Saturday. I have a crystal ball in for him to land at Boston College. I just talked to him uh, last 24 hours. Nothing. I still don't feel like I would ever change that. Um, I feel like they're in good position there. You have a couple other names that you're looking at too. Kowal Kowal, a a, um, offensive tackle from um, Centrisville, Ohio, is down to Purdue and BC. And he also has uh, Michigan State sniffing around. They just offered. So he might be a while. I talked to him yesterday and he said, uh, you know, it could, it could be as late as July or August, late July or August. So hold your breath on that one. And then Brian Augusti or Brian August. I don't know how to say his last name. Offensive tackle. He could be someone as well. He has not, he took a couple other visits. I believe he went to Syracuse and he went to Kentucky we have not yet heard where he's going to go. I heard BC was in really good shape with him before. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but those are two more. I mean, if you were to land all three of those guys, well, I'm talking Denzel Williams, Kowal Kowal, and uh, August, 
I'm I'm feeling like that would be a, a fine group, but that's a lot of question marks in there too, in terms of like, can you do that? Um, that I think I I think you know when you're looking at a class of four to five, which is what they were told I was told that they're looking for, you'd have to hit all those, and then maybe you add one more camper, you know, camp kid, you know, someone who has a huge senior year or or whatever, and that makes your five. But they, that's still a lot of work to do, right? You still have because at the end of the day, right now they have one commitment. That's it. Like I can tell you about all the good news and hopeful things, but I'm not behind the scenes. I can't tell you if they definitely are going to commit, and they haven't yet. So that is a, a, a still a position of concern. Um, I'm if you were to ask me, like rate what what looking at this class, uh, the three concerns I brought up. Lack of four stars, offensive line, defensive edge. What am I most concerned about at this point? Edge is my number one. Edge is my definitely my number one concern right now. I think they needed help there. I don't think they found enough uh, recruitment recruiting success at that position. I'm not I'm not as convinced with the guys that they have on their big board that are still available. I don't feel as confident as of any of them committing. So that's my number one. Number two. I would say is my offensive line. Again, lots of question marks there. Still, um, I feel like they're in better shape with more of their targets there than they are with edge. So that would be number two. And then four stars, because I'm going to leave this this part of our discussion here. You either trust Bill O'Brien and his staff to evaluate, or you don't. Look, I work for 247. I am, you know, I have a great faith in, in the scouts and the writers there. But they're not flawless. Do, when you when you look at these recruits, do you trust us as writers, or do you trust do you trust Bill O'Brien, a guy who's been around the program long enough? I mean, I have to say this. I have to say that Bill O'Brien is a guy that I would, if I were you, I would trust how he evaluates and, and, and watches film. He's been around. He knows what he's looking for. He knows what's going to be successful and what isn't. So when you get guys that are committing that aren't four stars, I feel confident that he knows if they're going to be successful or not. And I feel more confident that he knows it better than Jeff Halfley would have. And Steve Steve Adazio, I'm not even going to poo-poo on him. Because one thing, he he, he got some good names in here. So I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say that that, that Jeff Halfley had trouble with that. Um, I feel like there'll be less duds. And I feel like Bill O'Brien has done a nice job with that. Now, in our final segment, I want to look at a new rule in college football and how it will impact Boston College, both positively and negatively. And I'll explain what that means in just a moment. This is Locked On BC. I'm your host, AJ Black, and we're talking about a new rule in college football. Now, this week, it passed through the uh, you know council, or whatever changes rules for Division One football, that analysts are now allowed to be coaches on the side. There's basically no limit to the amount of on-field coaches that a school can have. Now, when you hear that, your first thought goes to, oh boy, Alabama is going to have a coaching staff of 400 coaches because they can afford it. And that's what they, that's what Nick Saban at one point seemed like he was going for. It it could be partially true. They're going to have a monster staff. They're going to definitely have that. But for a school like BC, this is a good thing too, for a couple of reasons. One, you now have a couple on-field coaches with head coaching experiences that can help in a variety of ways. You have Doug Marone, who has a head coach. I know he struggled at times, but he was a head coach at Syracuse. He was a head coach in the NFL. He can now be on the sidelines and coach. You have Rob Chadzinski, another head coach, who also was an offensive coordinator. You can use him for a variety of things. So you have some, you have your experienced guys on your staff that now can do things during games. That's a good thing for your staff. That is more brain power for your coaching group. Only a positive there, right? Now, the negative with with, with this is once these bigger programs, the ones with limitless money, it feels like, get a whiff that they can continue to do this, 
you best believe they're going to start poaching coaches that you would have brought in. And it's going to make it harder for you to find Doug Marone and Rob Chudzinski to come in. And if they do well, then you, you know, also know that they're going to get poached too. So that's going to be a challenge, but that's what BC is like in, in all sports, right? Like anytime the BC has success, you have to worry about other bigger programs coming in and taking that away from you because they have better resources than you do. So that's something to think about. But I look at it a different way too. Even if eventually you can't, you you, you lose your Marones, your Chizinskis, your your former coaches, even Chris Snee. Like it, that would have been great if have, having Chris Snee here. But Snee, I'm jumping ahead of here. But like having guys, younger guys that are learning how to coach, now being able to be on field and coach as well is also a selling point that Boston College can use. So I was talking about Snee. I meant to talk about him for this. He was a guy that you could not use as a coach. And it kind of limited his growth and what he could do at BC because he couldn't do anything during games. He was mostly a recruiting analyst. But now you could sell to a younger coach, especially someone with um, uh, a background in your school, the ability to learn and become a coach and, and to use them as a as visibility and, and um, get them going on their coaching journey here at Boston College. So that could be Chris Snee. I look at Will Blackman. Will Blackman seems like a guy that's got, you know, a, a rich career in a variety of things. He seems like he's got a lot of good things going on for him. But if he wanted to be a coach, this would be a great opportunity for him to move past the, the clinics and like the fellowships that he has to actually getting on the field to, 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 to coach too. Now he's going to get that. Chris Snee's gone. He's he's with the Giants, and he, I'm sure he might be kicking himself in the butt a little bit here that he's missing out on that opportunity. Maybe he's not. Maybe he has no regrets. But Blackman, this is perfect for him. This is going to give him the chance to try out some things during games, to learn more as he's doing it on the field, and to to be to have a bigger role so that he can parlay that into his next role, whether that's a positional coach or whatever he's going to do. So. This is a great thing for BC for those two reasons. Now, BC itself, for when they hired O'Brien, increased the pool for BC to hire coaches. That's why they brought in Marone. They brought in that off, uh, strength and condition coach. And I'm, I've heard that they spent good money to keep their coaching staff in place. But maybe that, that pool will help them in the future to keep on guys like Marone and Chudzinski and things like that. Um, but it, that I think that is something to watch for. But again... The flip side, side, other side of the coin is you have to watch to see if those bigger programs are just going to take everybody and <laughs> you get the table scraps left. So that's just the thought on that new rule. It's going to be in place this coming season. Like it's effective immediately. So these coaches, you, you're going to see Marone and Chizinski probably on the, on the field, unless there's a reason they don't want to come fall. Now, this is our Thursday show. This is show number four. Again, I joked about it. This supposed to be my vacation month. <laughs> and I'm not slowing down here at Locked On BC. We'll be back again tomorrow. I tell you, we're going to do five shows this week because there's so much to talk about. And I'll be back and I hope you enjoy it. Follow me on Twitter at AJBlack247. Come over to Eagle Insider and join our message board. We have a lot of people over there chatting about Boston College sports. Love to see you over there. And hit that subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts because we're great for the car. We're great for your office. If you're on, on a run and you want to listen to my awesome voice, come make sure you hit that subscribe button. I'd love to talk more about Boston College with you every single day. This is AJ Black again. We'll see you again tomorrow for another show of Locked On BC, your team every day.